with this, I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Jen and Eric uh, from Ridgewood High School. And I'm gonna say this thing as I do. Uh, there was a, an individual that many of us have gotten to know from um, a North Central Illinois school district who last winter uh, at the dual credit think tank referred to Ridgewood as the Shangri-La of all things PWR Act. And they, it, it was such a great comment. I, I mean, I remember when I first started really understanding what was going on at Ridgewood about five years ago, and then increasingly through some experiences I got to have four years ago and two years ago, and every step of the way, it was like, whoa, they're doing that, and they're doing that, and they're doing it so well. So Jen and Eric are, are two of the most humble leaders that I've ever met in education. So one of the great things I think about their success is that they're, they're always going to be the first to say, well, here's what we could still do better. Here's what we're trying to improve on now. Um, and let's be clear, because we do have people from around the state in this group, Ridgewood has, has also some great advantages in terms of their geographic location, the size of their school. But that's not to say it's easy. It's incredibly hard. Um, the goal here isn't to to catch up to Ridgewood or beat Ridgewood. It's just to learn from Ridgewood and to celebrate their success and then to help each school uh, and each district across the state move forward on whatever their pathway is in these directions. And so when we put something out there like this, it's not to say you have to do it the Ridgewood way in the Ridgewood timeframe and you're behind, not at all. It's to say, here's a, here's a blueprint that, that probably has some helpful things to learn. So congratulations and thank you to them turning it over to them now. And uh, please don't be shy about asking questions. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Um, I don't even know how to follow up with that. There's a lot of pressure on this presentation. <laughs> um, but I'm going to let Eric start. So unmute yourself and take off, Eric. All right, so we'd like you to, in the chat, just do a little reflection before we get started. and. You know, we sort of talk about this amongst our staff sometimes, like, you know, as a freshman, what did you want to be when you grew up? And you know, once again, you may not have an answer, you may not know, but then, you know, what did your school do to help you figure that out and what your interests were and what experiences did your school provide you to help explore corruption? So if you could go ahead and you don't have to answer all three, but just reflect on that in the chat, we'd appreciate it. Got an interior designer, we've got a lawyer, a vet, no clue, <laughs> teacher, Broadway, wow, nice, architect, accountant, marine biologist, no such thing as a career pathway to support it. We have that, don't we, Eric? <laughs> yes, there actually is. Now. That's actually one of For our big examples that we didn't, weren't sharing today. They, we, they had to realize if they wanted that pathway, chances were they would have to move. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to stay yes. in the Midwest, but yes. They did, quickly. Okay. So we'll touch a little bit on this later, but we always feel like, um, you know, this is one of the things that we ask ourselves and we want to make sure that we are doing something about with our freshmen. So, so I'm going to pick it up from here. Jason alluded a little bit about Ridgewood and I think he, he talked about the positive side of being in our area. I'm going to kind of talk about both sides of it. So we are located in Norwich. And for those of you who don't know where Norwich is, it's um, just outside of O'Hare Airport. Um, they actually call us the island in the city because we are completely surrounded by the city of Chicago. Um, we are the piece that the city of Chicago did not annex when they went all the way out to O'Hare Airport. Um, we are extremely small. 
So Eric, you want to go to the next slide? We are a two and a half mile radius district. That's it. And in our two and a half mile radius district, so we don't have buses. So when you're talking about making sure kids get to school on time, they're all walking or riding a bike or getting dropped off. Um, I think what's even more um, interesting about that two and a half mile radius, we have three elementary districts. Two districts feed completely into our building. One district has about usually no more than 10, sometimes as low as one student who feeds into our district and the rest go to Maine Township. So prior to our school being built in 1960, most of the kids went to Maine Township or Taft. Um, so it used to be that we were predominantly Eastern European and Italian, and that has since changed. Um, we are a one building high school district of 835 kids. Um, we have over 50 languages spoken. Um, so if you are walking down the halls, you could hear a variety of them. Um, we are 30% low income, 10% special ed, 8% EL, which is very low compared to what we used to be when I started here. Um, and I put in there just to get a sense that we're 65% white, 25% Hispanic, and 7% Asian, which I think is surprising to most when they start to see those numbers. Um, if you are familiar with the area compared to like 20 years ago when I started. <clears throat> so when we talk about pathways, we kind of want to put in perspective what's required um, in order to get that endorsement, right? So you kind of have to see the big picture and then how, does, how do you make it work in your own district? So there are four key pieces here. Um, individualized learning plan, you know, Jason alluded to the fact that we are a competency-based school. So our students do have individualized learning plans and that has been a journey in and of itself. Um, we could talk a long time about that process, about where we started to where we are. Um, but the short version is having that plan really helps students make some decisions that they might not have otherwise been able to make. Um, at the same time, having the right setup to have those conversations. So we use an advisory period. Um, and actually that has been probably one of the biggest silver linings of the pandemic is our use of that, of that time period and building relationships. And that is a whole story about how each teacher's kids were hand selected based upon interviews with every staff member to figure out the best kid to fit in that setting. Um, you also need to have some type of career exploration. And most people use Naviance, Zello, whatever you use, you have to have some way to demonstrate that kids have the opportunity to explore careers. One of the things that we've been fortunate to do because you know we have those two elementary districts and we don't always have um, control over what experiences they have, Eric found a way to use some of our um, EFE money, so those are your Employment for Education uh, money to provide all of our eighth graders with access to Zello so we can start them on that career journey a little sooner. Um, and we actually went in and trained their teachers on how to use it and they have a, a time period where kids can actually access it. Um, and actually it was pretty cool. We had a, a presentation last night with our board. One of our students talked about his experience of not necessarily just the career exploration, but having our teachers go over um, he's really into gaming and our uh, computer science teacher went and chatted with all the students and he couldn't be more excited to share his uh, coding experiences and how that was the program best fit for him. The third piece I think is the hardest piece. Um, Eric might be able to elaborate more on this about the labor market and this really came from our EFE um, director Ann Catherine. She did a bulk of the work behind this. Um, so I'm going to let Eric tap into this piece a little. Yeah. You know, it's important that when we set up these pathways that we want to make sure that if two, if students do complete these pathways, <clears throat> there are going to be jobs available for them and that their jobs pay well. We don't want to set our kids up and send them in a pathway where they come out making, you know, minimum wage, $12 an hour, because you cannot support a family necessarily on that. And we also want to make sure that the job growth is there. So really those are the two components is they're going to be able to get a job and they're going to make a good living and have a good career with that pathway. I think what was has been interesting with the career exploration and the, an example of the labor market, we our kids do a lot of activities in their English class as well as their business class on career exploration. And if you walk around when they're having these conversations and they're really digging into what they 
think they want to do, they'll start to say, oh, I'm only going to make $30,000. I can't do that. Or, oh, there are only 12 jobs available. That doesn't work for me. So they really start to have a, a good dialogue about understanding what their choices mean for the type of life that they want to have. And then the last piece for the um, pathway endorsements is that you have to be able to work with some type of post-secondary program. Typically, that is your community college. And for us, that's Triton. We're very blessed. Um, they have been very accommodating um, and in, in many ways as progressive as we need them to be in order to support our efforts. Um, but not all of ours are aligned to Triton. Um, our education pathway, we work with Northeastern University. So figuring out what works best for your pathway is, is really important. Um, you need to have courses um, that are dual credit. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the work we've done to help in that area. But again, Triton, extremely helpful. Um, you have to have related activities. You have to be able to offer the transitional math and English, which we piloted and have had both in our building. And that has been a huge game changer. Um, and not necessarily just for our kids who are struggling. I give the example, you know, we had a, an AP student who actually wanted to take the transitional English and we couldn't figure out why. And then she articulated it's because they did a lot more writing in the transitional English class than they did in some of our English classes. So that was um, good insight for us to understand we need to bring embed more writing experiences for our kids. So using their input is really helpful in guiding the direction you go. And then the last one are professional learning experiences. So they have to be able to explore those careers, do some team-based challenges, which don't always have to be in the classroom setting and then have some career development opportunities. So kind of seeing the big picture. And it seems like a lot, but you really wanna just start picking through what do you currently have in place that fits into this. So setting up your pathways, you know, it, it's, it takes time as you enter these into the system. And part of getting these credentials is you do have to lay them out. So you do wanna look at your courses, lay them out, organize them, see where they fit into your pathways. You know, so we had to go through that process. Um, lots of data entry. We had, you have to put in who your partners are. When you talk about partners, they want to know who your partners are in four, four universities, community colleges, technical schools, your work-based learning partners, unions. So there's a lot of different things that you got to sort of organize, put together um, when you're setting these up in the system. And that system is sort of, you fill it out and then you get approved to offer these uh, career endorsements. You also, they also want to know what are the credentials, certificates, or degrees that these will lead to, and what partners are you working with for that? Because once again, it doesn't do any good. All right, take these dual credit courses. We're going to get you an endorsement in this pathway, but there's nothing that goes with that. There's no certification, no degrees. So that's something you must lay out as you're setting these up as well and organize everything. You know, we talked about, you know, you have to have the two dual credit courses. So you want to put those in the system. System, what are those going to be? You can also put other courses that you offer that are not dual credit that you want students to take that are going through these pathways. They will ask you what are the gatekeepers to these pathways in terms of your English and especially of your math. So what are the math courses in the end that kids are going to need to take? And most of the time you put your transitional math courses and that could be different with maybe transitional STEM, transitional quantitative stats or transitional tech based on the path that students are going down. So the time it does, it does take time to enter all this, to get it all set up. You want to give yourself a summer to do that. We were fortunate enough to have one of our uh, summer workers that, that uh, one of our former students comes in the summer and works, and they spent quite a bit of time at doing the data entry part of this um, and entering all the pieces that you really need to get these pathways set up um, so you can get the credentials to Illinois State Board of Ed. So I want to talk a little bit about like the difference between a small school and a large school, because I believe on this call, we have a variety of different district sizes. And there's a mindset that in some cases, it's easier to do this in a small school or it's easier to do it in a large school. So I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about the difference, right? We're, as you can tell, a very small school. Our administrative team is very small. So it... it from a building level, there's a principal and assistant principal. And those are the true administrators. There's a dean and athletic director, but they don't particularly engage in this part yet. Their, their, their job will change a little next year. Um, but then there are five division heads. 
So the plus side of being small is we have this flexibility to kind of think differently about how we use the people we have to their strengths. And so we keep redesigning as we move through this journey, we know that it's going to continue to change. Like the title division head will no longer be division head because it doesn't serve us. But needless to say, Katie, who's on this call, she is new in this position this year. She is our director of student, she oversees student services and career pathways. Um, Eric, as the assistant principal, he was the division head of STEM last year. He did the bulk of this work as a STEM division head next to um, our other division head of curriculum instruction. I don't have district level people, right? District office is myself and an assistant superintendent. So we're able to still do all of this work that's required with a very small team. And I think the same is true for a very large school, right? Where you have layers of people that you can tap into to say, director of curriculum, I need you to work on this. Um, your director of careers, I need you to work on this, right? So I wanted you to understand, like, even though we're small, we've been creative at, with our resource use. And, you know, that's a whole side conversation that we can talk about how to look at using people differently in your roles. And we talk about kind of that strengths base, where are people's strengths and let's let them lead in those areas. Um, and this has really helped in this lens. So yes, it's sometimes easier in a small school. I guess not a lot of red tape, right? Like everyone in the building can come straight to the superintendent's office because I'm in the building and say, hey, we need this. Um, and we all work together. And so I think that is helpful. But when you have a large staff, um, you can do that. So we'll talk, Esther asked about enrollment. We're gonna to get to that, about how it works. But I wanted you to understand like, how do you put this together depending on your school size? I think it's doable for anyone. You just have to find the people who are best suited for those roles. So for us, when you think about the seven career pathway endorsement areas, it becomes a little bit uh, cumbersome, right? Like how do you take a small school and figure out all these pathways? So what we ended up doing is we split the pathways into two chunks and you can do this however you want, right? For us, what worked for us is arts and science um, because we could easily put our courses and experiences into that and to business and tech. But I'm gonna walk you backwards on how we got to that point. So as you all know, I'm assuming you know, the state and the, you know, there are 16 career clusters. So Eric, I think you're going to go to the next slide. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, you see the, all the career clusters, ag, food, nutrition, education, training, hospitality, tourism. So those are your normal 16. If you work up one level, you can see how the seven Illinois career pathways fit those 16 career clusters, at least how we see them, into those seven pathways, right? So Again, we're small, how do you take and build seven pathways? We had to then break it down into what we viewed as two separate pathways. And so we can then staff it a little differently from an arts and science lens and a business and tech. Um, and so that's just to show you our, how, how our brains thought to be able to do this for a small district. Where some of you in large districts, you may be able to label them all seven career pathways. We label them two for the sense of not overwhelming our staff, right? And not overwhelming students. But we know when we talk arts and science, we're really talking about those four career pathways that align with the state. And we talk with business and tech, it relies on those three. So for us, this is how we had to break it down. You could do it however you want, but this was easy for our staff to understand. Um, and then we could help them see where they fit into it. And that this year, we actually rolled out our why, went through the whole PWR Act again, and then let them decide which of these pathways did they feel more comfortable in, because that's part of our future work. So giving teacher choice as well, you know, we give our students choice, we give teachers choice, and we'll talk a little bit about how that plays out in some of our future direction. And, you know, sometimes people think just electives and they're like, oh, so the electives would fall under one of these two pathways. But really, our goal is that we want our core curriculum to be related to these pathways as well. Like currently, we offer two integrated science. We have integrated science, too. We offer two different options 
really one for their going into the arts and science path, one that's going the business tech path. And the same thing with our math courses. At our sophomore and junior level, we actually offer different pathways for the math and how it relates because we want the whole curriculum to revolve around these pathways, not just electives. So our freshman year, um, you know, so some of you are like, well, how do we enroll our students into these programs or pathways? Our freshman year is our explore year. And we do a lot of different things. We do use our advisory. We do the Zello, the matchmaking personality style. But we also have our freshman project is that students will take everything they find and they actually will be presenting about the research they did on what is, you know, what pathway or what career options they have. And based on all the, the surveys that they take, they look at it. They look at the requirements for education, the job outlook, the salary, job description, typical work week. They look at all those things and then they sort of choose a path and choose some careers and then they present on that. And that's where they sort of make sure they know, um, you know, once again, what is the, the typical work week look like for that? Is that the work week you want to have? Where are these jobs located at? Are you willing to move, relocate for those? You know, if you have those jobs, what are the salaries? What are the costs? Of, you know, so can you live on those salaries? So those are all the things that they look at. And we also have a visit to Triton. So that way they can sort of see, and sometimes people are like, well, are they all going to Triton? No, but Triton has a lot of programs and most four universities are going to have programs similar to that. But as freshman year, we want them to know all the different options, all the different things they can major in within an area. Because some people think there's a doctor and then there's a nurse and there's no other medical fields. They don't know that until we take this trip to Triton and then they see all the different options they can have. And that's sort of another thing we look at is we want our kids to be like, if, if you want to work in a medical field, let's go down this pathway. Let's not say I'm gonna be a doctor on day one. Let's say we're gonna go into the medical field and now you have many different options which can change over, over the next three years. But we want our kids to go in a direction. I think it's important, like one of the big changes, we're, we've got a lot of moving parts here because we're still trying to in transition to 100% competency. So we, three years ago now, or two years ago, redesigned our entire freshman year experience. And so we wanted to fill in the gaps of what's it like to learn at a high school level? What do they need to understand about competency? What do they need to know about careers? What do they need about study skills? So we looked at the whole big picture and then had to redesign that whole freshman experience. So we took a team of teachers, let them um, figure out, we gave some deliverables, then what does this look like in practice? And so we're on year two of implementation, I think. I'm looking at Eric's, I think so. Yeah. Um, so because we know when we start different with freshmen, by the time they get to senior year, that senior year needs to look different than our current senior year. So we've kind of now got this four-year rollout. Pandemic has helped amplify and move that forward in some ways. Um, but you, our freshmen don't have your typical experience that I think most of you have, where they end up having to eventually select what they're doing at specific time slots, right? Kind of releasing that student ownership over time. And so we built in um, chunks of time that are not equivalent to maybe what the sophomore, junior, or senior student is experiencing so that they are having these opportunities. Um, so I think this, I just see the question about, are they still having the visit with, with COVID? So they did. Eric, you wanna talk about how we yeah. did the Triton visits this yes. year? Yeah, so actually it was uh, virtual. So we actually did uh, virtual visit, visits. They actually, all, if you look at all those, uh, all the career clusters, they actually had representatives from each one of them. And Triton actually offered that for all the schools feeding into them. So we have um, quite a few high schools that feed in Triton. So they set them up and they set up every um, two week period, every day from 2.30 to 3.15, they had um, a different virtual career exploration for the different programs. In the past, what we do is we had our students normally pick one thing they wanted to explore deeper and they would go over there and they would uh, get to see the facility and get the presentation. This actually made it a little bit nicer because now we instead, we asked our kids to pick at least two different things to explore. And some of our kids actually explored more. So our kids had the opportunity to really look and they can go, if they wanted to go um, both weeks, they can go both weeks and see all the programs that Triton offered in different pathways. We took advantage of that because of those two weeks. We also 
Um, they did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We did uh, Friday, we threw Ridgewood sort of own customized one for our education pathway and our manufacturing pack pathway. So that way we can get our students doing a little more exploration on those as well. And we had really good turnout and we were able to sort of, uh, sort of fill our pipeline of students that are going to be coming through our pathways to get our endorsements from those two weeks. So it, it uh, you know, Triton set it up that way and actually worked out really well for us. We'd rather go in person, but um, but this really was a good a good thing. So I think the other piece that you know is you know, we're gonna we're gonna emphasize as it goes through here is you have to change the the narrative for people about the difference between. Um, the, the mindset of being a college bound student versus a career student. So we all know every student ends up with a career. So their path there is different. And so we start to help, um, we had to help our entire staff understand every, we're not like this career school, but we are because everyone gets a career, right? And so how do we look at their routes differently? And that goes back to that individualized plan. And so this helps with that narrative as well, because we all know that not everyone's going to need to go to a four-year or two-year. So I think as you see some of our examples, you'll get to the sense of what that could look like. Okay. And one of the questions, do they do it on their own time or a specific time? Actually, at, from 2.30 to 3.15 is actually one of our intervention time, uh, sort of our inter intervention period that we use for our students with the office hours. So it was, I mean, you can sort of say, yes, it's school time, but at the same time, some of those students, if they did not have to be in the intervention, it sort of wouldn't be their own time. Um, we, we sort of told, we told our students that they had to complete two of those. So and like again, some complete a lot more than two. So I guess you could, it sort of was school time, but also a little bit of their own time um, for those virtual visits. So you always wonder like, what are some examples of the pathway or how do students complete the pathway? What do they do? And it starts off with your faculty. You gotta have faculty that are passionate about that pathway that are willing to do some recruiting, willing to work, uh, willing to sell that program because they see the value and they wanna make sure that, that people are successful. And we were fortunate enough to have a couple of teachers that really felt, Katie Davis is one of them on this call, that this education pathway, we need to start growing our own teachers and this is su there's such a shortage of teachers we need to do something about it and they did and they set up a pathway um, and their pathway was uh, partnered with Northeastern Uni Illinois University and through that our juniors and seniors senior year they have classes that they actually go to Northeastern to take you can sort of see this on this chart and then they have another class that they take senior year at Northeastern as well and then we also offer some in-house courses at uh, Ridgewood. We offer survey and education and an intro to methodology. Um, part of the, one of the, when you look at the uh, Illinois requirements for the pathway, they really want that methodology course. That's a hard course for our students to go take as a dual credit because most methodology courses are specific to the content. You're going to math methodology or English or, you know, methodology. It's hard to have just a methodology high school to, students can take. So we worked um, over the summer and actually collaborated with a couple other high schools to create this methodology course so our students could take that um, as part of the pathway in education. Some of the other things that um, were nice about this is not only did our students get to go take classes at Northeastern, um, they did a lot of observations. And once again, our teachers that ran this program, they wanted them to observe every component of education, not just the teaching part, they want to make sure that they're observing the social workers, counselors, technology, administration. And so they had to do some, some observation hours for each of those, along with observing with our uh, partner schools, our elementary schools. And then there's actually another high school that they um, were able to, they actually went to visit the main township high schools, get some observation hours there. The great thing about this is not only were our students able to get those 60 work-based learning hours for the pathway, Northeastern actually gave them credit for those hours as well. So if they continue at Northeastern, you know, you always have those requirements for how many observation hours that you need. They would already be credited with some of those observation hours as they went um, from what they did in high school. So that's one of our pathways. We had five students that actually earned that career endorsement on their diploma last year. 
Um, and we were fortunate enough that we got all our work-based learning hours before COVID occurred last year with, uh, with those students over those two years. We do have a couple other pathways that we got endorsements for. We have our manufacturing pathway. Um, I'm going to let Jen talk a little bit about that because she's done a lot of work with the band. This is my passion. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you a little background why this was so important for us. So Eric alluded last time you had to have faculty that were passionate about these pathways. You also have to look at the needs of your community. And so in our backyard, literally a series of manufacturers. And when I was the building principal, <clears throat> the superintendent at the time, was helping push the STEM initiative and was meeting with all these manufacturers really in a, in a passive way. We weren't getting, neither of us were getting the results. So when I stepped in as superintendent, I spent my first year attending every manufacturing event I could because I needed to understand manufacturing today, not what it was for my mindset of growing up. And it was an amazing experience and I built some really great relationships. So we resurrected our kind of our STEM advisory board, but we looked at it from the lens of what do you need? And they kept saying we need employees. And I said, okay, what does that mean? I said, and then the short version is we don't have the space, the resources, um, staff, whatever, to offer a manufacturing program in our building. So we said, where do you send your people to be um, trained? And they said TMA. And then we're like, okay, we need TMA in the conversation. Can we send our kids there to be trained? And they said, oh, okay, let's talk about this. So we ended up sending our kids to TMA, which is out in Schaumburg. So, you know, we got to bus our kids there, which think about, you know, what I said, all our kids walk. So they create a very different day. They would leave for two days a week for a chunk of four hours and still have to then be held accountable for what they missed out of their normal classes. So they did that for a semester. The first go around of this, or first two go rounds, they received NIMS credentialing and mill and lathe. So they walked away with industry credentials. But the really cool piece was um, our, one of our manufacturers agreed to do an internship the second semester. So they all received paid internships at the local manufacturing behind us at QCC. Um, John Gorman has been an amazing help. And they were all given personal mentors that their staff met with our staff to say, what type of kid is this? I'm going to match them up with an, a mentor in, the, in my building. So they, got, they left school to go get their paid internship. And then at the end of the, the, for the year, they were all offered jobs at QCC. Now, two ended up going on to engineering, so they left to go to college. Um, and the rest have taken jobs there or have taken a job at another manufacturing. So that nece wasn't necessarily teacher driven, but what was important is getting our staff to understand manufacturing today. So we did some field trips, right? We can walk right over. We took our staff and we took our counselors and we said, we're gonna take you over to the manufacturer so they can talk to you about what manufacturing is today. And then they also created some really um, amazing educational brochures so we could educate kids, right? So we do have a very passionate counseling and social work staff who knew kids that this would fit. So that's where that passion of the staff fit in and they helped us figure out who would be best served. And if I could go back to the first year, good old Bobby who would have dropped out of high school until this experience came in and he rocked this experience. Um, and we, I'll never forget, we had, um, I think it was Miss Almi in and a couple people from the state yeah, about ahead. math. So we had Bobby who was a manufacturing student would have dropped out sitting next to our good old Amanda Dynick who is now at Harvard, right? talking about their math experience. And it was at that point, Bobby realized he was doing the same math she was, and she was going to Harvard or MIT at that time. So it was just really cool, like for kids to see, like I found what I wanna do and I'm really good at it and I can use my skill sets to be successful. And so finding those right connections is huge. But for us, we wanted people to be able to contribute to the community who wanted to stay in the community. Um, and at that time, you know, that group of kids also had to defend their graduation. So one student in particular talked about this um, experience and he, at, the, at this presentation for his defense, his parents were there because the kids get to invite anyone. And that's when he told them he had a full-time job. Like he got his job offer and signed his contract. 
So the tears were coming. It was just a really great experience because some parents know their kids and they're like, I don't know what you're going to be doing. And then to find their, their niche is helpful. Um, so that, that the manufacturing piece for us is really huge just because it, it only serves for some of you said, you know, how do you do all these with small numbers? You know, we're lucky if we get six kids a year. So if we get 10, we're super excited because of the cost to send them over, you know, is huge. And we pick up that cost. Um, I will say the manufacturers, um, we've had our conversations about how they can help contribute financially because they know it's a huge cost on us. And so they've offered some scholarships to help pay for it. So finding ways to, to do the financial side is also important. We also have a, we have a computer science pathway. This one, we have not had any students earn the endorsement in yet, but that is our goal. Our main issue is, and you'll see that in these pathways, is sometimes it's hard to get those work-based learning hours. And that's where we're sort of falling a little bit short on this. But we did, in this pathway, we do have a partnership with, um, with, you know, with Wright College. And Wright College actually takes our students. And we had two students last year, and we're hoping to have another two students this year. But they have actually have a program where these students get to go to Wright College uh, a couple days a week, and they work a couple days a week as well. And uh, so they work 20 hours a week paid, and they get their school paid for, and all their, you know, so really they get, they end up getting um, a nice degree with their computer science with uh, zero debt, and then they actually get the experience too. So it's like, that, and that's one thing you, we've noticed in computer science is now they don't want the degrees, they really like the experience. So having this program has been great. And once again, we, I don't, we're trying to get to where we can give the uh, endorsement on their diploma, but at least we have this pathway set up and the students do end up, um, you know, with being able to have some great opportunities with that. Um, so there's a question, what is endorsements for computer science pathway? So, um, there's many different ones. There's a lot of certifications that they can get when you look at these endorsements, but mainly when I was talking about the endorsements that uh, it's really, it's it's the career pathway endorsement from Illinois State Board of Ed. Um, and meeting all those requirements is, is sort of what we're talking about uh, with that. But once again, we one of those requirements was that 60 work-based learning hours. So that's where we're having trouble with that, with, with this pathway. But we do offer this pathway for our students. And one thing we did differently is starting uh, two years ago, if a student wants to be in the computer science pathway, we say, all right, first priority is we assign them their computer science classes, and then we make sure everything else fits into their schedule. Whereas in the past, we'd assign them their classes and, okay, do you have room for a computer science class? So we feel like we need to change the way we do business. This is the top priority for them. And then we fill everything else in. Um, but no, so not an industry credential, but our students are, we have some other things where we are setting up uh, some testing with Cisco and stuff where kids will be getting some credentials now. Uh, one of our main things is our computer science or our cybersecurity. Um, we, uh, we are starting to do the project lead the way cybersecurity. So that will really help with the students getting some uh, credentials as well. And then our, uh, one other pathway that we're really doing well on now too, and we'll have some students that are gonna finish with the career endorsement is our construction pathway. And this is another one where how do we get those uh, 60 work-based learning hours? And because of insurance reasons and stuff, there are some things it's hard to get our kids out to the jobs. But what we found out is the main thing with those 60 work-based learning hours is that we need our students to be working with the professionals. So we bring those professionals now to Ridgewood where the students are now building a home. So they actually are doing real work but then they, it's not just in the real work, but they have to be doing the real work with professionals. So we need to, we bring in our union and our, and we have a lot of people in our community that do our contractors work with unions. So now we can bring them in and they can work with them at our school as they're actually building a home that is eventually sold and used by somebody. So we can get them those uh, work-based learning hours. So that's another one where our students, we should have some, we have five students in that pathway. We'll see how many actually meet all the requirements, but we should be having some students with that endorsement at the end of this year. And the beauty of this one is the goal is that students who are in kind of that marketing and entrepreneurial pathway would be able to market the sale of this and then work with the realtors on selling so that you can kind of get the full experience. That hasn't happened quite yet, but that's one of our next steps. So how do you, um, you know, if you hear us talk a lot, you say we like to shift the, the narrative of that the core, your typical core classes should become the, the ancillary of supports to your elective, right? So 
we talk about that the career, the elective should be driving the learning and then using that to engage kids and bring in your math, science, English, social studies. It's kind of the supports so that you start to see the connections because we, we get rid of the silos, right? When the kids learn in silos, you know, let me spend 15, 50 minutes here, ring a bell, go to the next room, stop learning this. They don't know how to make the connection. So we talk about no cells, no bells, right? Um, because they, they need to understand the work that they're doing and how it translates to something else. And in particular, our construction was um, geometry and construction. We had kids who've never been able to be successful at math, who totally embrace this. Um, and it has helped um, even in the gender area, we've got a lot of females who are now going the construction route. So you start to look at your equity pieces, well, the work we've done um, has really changed. Um, it's helped us close our, our achievement gap with our Hispanic population in all, in all areas of testing and direction and future goals. So um, that's been helpful. Sam made a, a great, or uh, Gina made a great point, in-house internship for the IT group with your tech department. And we do have one student who um, does have a 60 work-based learning hours because of an internship he did actually a couple summers ago. Unfortunately, this summer, we did not let any of our kids do the intern. Yeah, with, with these times, we are not letting them do the internship with IT, but that in the past was a great opportunity. So good point there, Gina. Um, so we do wanna get to uh, some of the things that, you know, some, some basically some next steps for us and what we, from based on what we learned and some tips for you, so. So we, we try to create quite a few here. Um, I, th I think one piece that you have to kind of understand is our schedule is so flexible, right? When we see what a kid needs, we create a schedule that matches it. So I can give like two quick examples. Several years ago, we had a student who entered who knew she wanted to go to MIT. The only way you can go to MIT is if you do real research. So we had to figure out which science teacher was willing to do real research and we had to connect with a college professor, right? And so she ended up doing her research. Long story short, she went to MIT. Rockstar got in, you know, but she wouldn't have been able to do that without that, without that research. Um, and then fast forward a few more years, we had another student who thought she wanted to go to MIT, but she had already taken before she got here, like classes at Northwestern in the summer and really thought MIT was a route. And so she did not know what type of what area she wanted to study in. So the same science teacher created a very different experience for her in the summer that allowed her kind of an exploratory to figure out what aspect of science she was most interested in. And then we had a meeting with uh, the student and her parents to say, okay, your child needs a different route than what the traditional student has. Let's talk about what that looks like. And she stayed somewhat, because she had already taken AP Calc as an eighth grader, and so how do you, you kind of really have to figure out what you're doing differently? And she ended up, um, we had to create an entire different schedule for her. She did not go to MIT. She went to Harvard instead. That's where her sister went. So I say that because you can see that the whole spectrum, when we talk about career options, we're not talking about um, every path is different, right? Some are going to go to an Ivy League. And we get a lot of kids in Ivy Leagues, which most people don't realize, right? We've got a couple at... Harvard, a couple at Princeton, we got some at Yale, um, we've had a couple at MIT, but we also, that's not our end goal, right? If that's not your end goal, that's not our end goal. So when we talk about that flexible schedule, students help have say in how they create that day. So for example, I got a kid right now who is passionate about automotives, was a struggling learner before the pandemic, a struggling learner in the pandemic. We had to create an entire new experience for that student as well as 22 other ones. They have a whole different school within a school experience that they are charting what they want to learn and how they want to learn it. Like his presentation on using stoichiometry chemistry in the engine of a car blew me away. Like he learned chemistry in ways that most kids could never learn it. So we talk about being very flexible here. Um, and as you can see, they, we want them to learn their core content and career. So if we're talking long-term, I guess the easiest way to visualize it is let's say you have the career path for, um, we'll divide our staff into two, arts and science and your business and tech. 
And then you're going to kind of see those two break up. So you may have a chunk of 400 kids who are going to be potted into groups of 50 or 100. And then they're going to start to work on their career focus. And then their learning comes with it. Very different, I think, than most people think through. Um, but they won't be running by bells. Um, they, they have very specific competencies they need to accomplish. And in that time, they would leave the building to go do interns or to um, work. We found in the pandemic, a lot of our kids had to take a job in order to uh, provide for the family. So that's something we'll continue. We want everyone to earn a credential and an associate's degree before they leave here. We've got a really good start. All of our freshmen get nine dual credit hours freshman year. So that's in PE, computer science, and project lead the way. Correct me if I'm wrong. Am I missing one, Eric? Those are the nine. Yep. Um, so they all get nine hours their freshman year. Um, so we also want them to be able to present well so they have to defend their graduation. So that's kind of our next steps. A couple of our tips. Um, I know we're sort of running out of time here. But some of our, our tips are, first off, Pathways are for all students. A lot of times people think, oh, this is just for those students that aren't going to college. But it, you know, as Jen mentioned, even those students that want to go to those top schools, these pathways are going to be what allow them to get into some of these top schools. So every, you know, as she said, every student's going to end in a career. So these pathways are for all students. You know, some of the questions out there, well, do students have flexibility? What if they choose a path? We ask all our freshmen at the end of their project in English, pick a pathway. We want them to go down a pathway and we want them to realize they do not like this pathway. And yes, they can switch before their, you know, $60,000 in college debt because they tried that pathway after high school. So we do want all our students to pick the pathway, have some experience. Um, and the other thing that, you know, tips that we have is that we really want to train your counselors and get them into this because they, a lot of times they have a lot of direct contact with the students. Uh, um, you know, I remember we were actually last year's P20 conference, a little kick for that. I remember that one counselor said, the success of a counselor is not how many students they send off to college, it's how many students finish whatever program they send them off to. And I thought that was great. Um, I wish I remember it was somebody from 214 that said it, but I thought that was, that is really what we want to do is whatever we send our kids off to after high school, we want them to complete that and be successful. And it really you know, it's not what, you know, we're not looking at what path, it's just, are they going to be successful when they leave here in that pathway? So I know we're out of time, but we, um, if you guys want to ask any questions, we can stick around. Well, I want to end with one piece. I think I added on a slide, but it didn't get on here because I, Eric was already in the slide. I think the piece that I, you got to start with your why. And for us, yeah. this is our why, right? We've done everything that our community has asked us. And going back to our why, like when we work with our counselors, Going back to our why we started this year, like we did the whole career pathway um, presentation again with the staff kind of as a reminder, right? So career pathways, every we have them embedded into our professional development. Like Monday's agenda has a whole career pathway piece. So it's, it's what we do. It's who we are. It's what we expect of everyone. Um, and that shift takes a little bit of time, right? Because for those of you who are typically in a college bound, college bound, and people don't see a career at the after college, it becomes a little bit more challenging. Um, but using our counselors in the whole PACE process and let them guide that, let them be the leaders, help them better understand, oh, I see what we're talking about, right? And I, I will give a huge shout out to Ann Catherine, who is our DVR, um, our EFE director. She's retiring this year and she'll be dearly missed, but she helped us understand big picture and how, um, what resources are available. And we have an annual workshop that we bring teams of people to and the PWR has been our piece all along and uh, bringing our counselors to help them truly understand those components was huge. Sorry, yeah, it's a lot of information in a short amount of time. So first of all, I don't know about anybody else listening, but I'm ready to go back to high school. And with all due respect to my high school teachers and administrators, I wanna go back to high school at Ridgewood. Um, I don't know who else is feeling that way after listening to this, um, but it's so exciting. And so thank you both and congratulations to you. Um, yeah, Lindsay Sharp's getting religious on that point. So thanks, Lindsay. Um, the, we, 
Eric has said they, at least Eric, I don't know about Jen, I asked Eric uh, while Jen was talking, has a few minutes to answer questions because we've still got some really awesome questions in the chat and we want to get those answered. Um, so I'm going to try and feed those um, to Eric thinking about what he said. And if I miss one, uh, just throw it in the chat or unmute. So I'm going to start with John's question. Um, do you guys have every student choose a pathway and how do you schedule students who say they don't know what they want to do? So yeah, we do. That's part of their freshman project, their English project, is after they do that and they present, part of their presentation is picking one of those two pathways that we sort of talked about. So it's not, it doesn't have to be as detailed, but we want them to start exploring more in either the arts and science or business and tech. So we do ask all our students to do that. And then we ask them to pick um, some electives in that area uh, sophomore year. So all students do, but they're not necessarily stuck in that. And some aren't, com you know, some have conviction like, hey, this is it. And some are, I think I'll go, you know, so, um, and those that are like, I think I go, they need some more exploring sophomore year, maybe even the junior year, so. Cool, that's, that's very helpful to me as a parent in this house right now too. Do you, uh, how do you staff for this type of flexibility? There's so much that goes into that. So I guess we kind of, we've always looked at what do kids want to do? And then we um, fill our teachers to fit that. So we don't hire more people. <laughs> you know, the board is pretty tight on FTEs. Again, it goes back to being creative um, and how you use your people. Um, and having a really good working relationship with your union is helpful. Um, I will say we, we will be negotiating a new contract next year and we are going to change the language to really, um, I think, be innovative on both sides of the lens of how does it help teachers be seen more as a professional and have some flexibility in their own schedule. Like, oh, like I would like to drop my kids off. Can I start, can I shift my start time? Oh, I'd like to pick my kids up and I shift my end time, right? Our kids get that same option, right? We give kids late starts, early dismissals, um, they have office hours. It's, there's a whole piece to that. Um, but someone asked about the uh, counselor piece. So several years ago, we had three counselors and two social workers, and we saw a big shift in our SEL needs. And so we shifted to three social workers and two counselors, and we break our, we use one of our social workers. She works solely with freshmen and kind of helps do both sides. She has an amazing background. And then the two counselors split then pretty much sophomore, junior, senior. We put a request in, we would like our third counselor back. So I am pushing for the first time ever for another FTE um, because we, based upon what we're doing with Career Pathways, that we, we need another uh, person to really support us. And then it goes back to the staffing. If you could walk next door into my nice little glass board, you know, for we have it kind of, charted out how our needs are gonna change over the next couple of years and how do we use our, the, the strengths of our, some of our staff members to fill those needs as we move forward. So we really just kind of play with what we have. Um, and we're really fortunate that we've got people who are like, yeah, I'd love to do that. Or no, 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 don't put me there, but I'll do this. And so we give a lot of choice to our staff as well. Cool. Are there on and off ramps for students if they decide a pathway isn't the right fit while they're at Ridgewood versus like Eric said, after they've accrued $60,000 worth of financial aid? Tell you, Eric. Yes, it, like you said, yeah, that, that's definitely is. And that's one of the points is we want them to get those experience. I know somebody in the chat talked about they wanted to be a, a veterinarian and that's probably one of the biggest paths that we have students. We have so many students who want to be veterinarians and then they actually go get some work, some experience and realize it's not cuddling and petting dogs. It's, it's it, it cannot be, <laughs> sometimes it's not the nicest atmosphere and they realize that is not the path for me. So that's part of the point of this is um, once again, go down a path, see if you like it. If not, let's go down another one um, and try to get it figured out before you leave, so. Uh, what platform do you use to house their web portfolio? Right now, there's actually um, an extension on Canvas that we're able to use, but we are switching that over to Transio. Um, you know, so that is something we'll, you know, so we'll be using Transio probably next year. So we're still working on that setup, but right now, 
um, Canvas actually bought, I can't remember what the portfolio or something, I think that we were able to use. So. Okay, and then just finishing up, there were a couple questions that Eric and Jen have answered in the chat also about uh, using Perkins funds for Transio and that there are 55 uh, teachers at Ridgewood. Yeah, so we have we have pretty small staff, I would say, like given what we are able to do. Um, you know, you asked about the counselors. Our counselors, our social workers, they all have an advisory now um, because it it we needed them in order to fill to to do what we needed to do for advisory. But it's also helped them build some relationships and understand how the inner workings outside of their office happen. And so they don't, they're not uh, like sit in my office anymore type of people. They kind of are, let's get out and about and go meet kids where they are. Um, because we used to hear forever, like kids don't, don't take their passes. I said, then go to them, right? Like <laughs> this is, it may seem like we're too accommodating, but let's start with meeting them where they are and then working to do the release of it. They are 14 year olds and 15 year olds. So kind of shifting that mindset of what seems like we're too accommodating to know that's where their needs are right now until we help them understand how to better advocate and um, self-monitor and all of those good pieces, right? But small staff, man, our staff works hard. <laughs> I think Katie, who's new, Katie's on this call. Katie, do you wanna add anything based upon like your experience? You're just stepping into the division head role this year. I don't know if she had to jump off, I'm looking. Oh, she's on. Um, I would say, the teachers are all very accommodating with like always being student first. So I think that has also helped with like the pathways and like the direction that we're going. But um, being new to the role, I know personally I'm learning so much and I'm loving this role and then just seeing the direction that we are taking the school. So I think the one piece, I don't know, like we talk about a lot of dual credit classes. You know, we set up our contract many years ago to encourage people to get master's degrees in their content areas so that we'd have more dual credit teachers. Um, so when we hire, we kind of look for that as one piece. Um, two, when they want to do their move, lane movements, they have to get approved through me, and it's typically in a content area, um, unless I've got some in tech because we just need some other areas. Um, but we've done... And then if they need coursework, Triton has been really accommodating to help us get more people um, dual credit approved. Um, so we've, we've done a much better job on looking at the needs for what we want to do, which is why we have nine credit hours for freshmen for dual credit. That's all in our building. Um, and so it's helpful. It's, you've got to really think through how that plays out. Our contract's written like you max out in 10 years with your bachelor's because we don't want teachers with bachelor's. We want teachers with their master's degree who can then provide more opportunities for our kids only because that's what required, they're required. Like we're working, when I said about changing the contract, like my shop teacher doesn't need a master's degree. Like that doesn't help me. So now we're working in language. How does his work experience or his credentialing, um, how can we use that to move him on his salary schedule? that is appropriate to his career field. Um, so that what we're trying to do with our students, we're also doing with our staff. So you can start to see, like, I always say, don't expect more of your kids than what you expect of yourself. So if we're gonna expect this of kids, we need to be able to give the same opportunities to our staff. Awesome. Well, thank you again. What a great way to start a Friday morning and we really appreciate it. And again, we hope that, that this opportunity for all three of you from Ridgewood and everybody else there can walk away from it with, you know, a feeling of pride. And again, to all of everybody who, who participated today, thanks for participating. Uh, we will post this and follow up uh, with the link so everybody has it if you want to show other people. And um, please reach out, certainly feel free to reach out to me so that we can support the work happening in your districts moving forward. Um, because everybody is going to have to take their own path. So there are a lot of awesome lessons here to help us uh, kind of find markers in our own paths towards the future. So thanks again, everybody. I'll stick around for a few minutes if uh, anybody needs anything. But hope you have a great Friday, great weekend, and stay warm.
Thank you. Thanks.